Welcome to Rose City Politics for a special episode. We're very excited today to be able to welcome Flavio Volpe, the president of the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association. Flavio, how are you today? I'm good today, John, and I know that we've been talking about getting together on this for a while, and I'm so happy to be able to do it. Really appreciate your time. Can't imagine uh, the stress that you're under. Wanting to speak with you primarily today about two different uh, topics, but you know they kind of do relate hand in hand. First off, the retooling that was undertaken to deal with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and what it was like having to spool up a complete retooling of our domestic manufacturing production um, towards something brand new, hadn't been done before. In Windsor, Essex, we have uh, experience of this, but you know, going back 75, 80 years now to World War II, the last time that it was done. Um, and then we'll uh, begin talking about Project Arrow as well. Canada's first build concept vehicle EV project. Really cool, you know, made in our own backyard solution to yet another existential crisis. So, Flavio, I just want to let you just sort of start talking a little bit about what was it like? It was a year ago when the world really started to see that we were dealing with something that wasn't just, you know, murmurings on television. We were now starting to watch our world shut down, borders start closing. Um, professional sports associations. That was, I think, a big one for a lot of people to realize that it hit close to home for them. So what was it like? You're looking at a really existential threat for your um, partners, for your um, partners that you work with on a daily basis. You know, if there's no economy, they're not going to be able to continue doing what they're doing, not to speak too, you know, broadly about this. But what was it like having to pull them together, dealing with this situation that none of you were expecting to deal with? You know, John, you and I are from the same generation. I'm probably a little bit, uh, judging by my hairline, uh, probably a little older than yours, than you are. But, um, but you know, neither one of us has been called to war. And, uh, you know, there's the old adage, uh, those who don't study history are destined to repeat it. You know, I just, did, uh, just spent uh, um, a follicle-dropping evening with my son last night doing his history homework. He says, no one cares about this. It's never, it's not important. And the reality is our response to the COVID crisis last year, as you alluded to, and what we're doing on Project Arrow is about knowing your history. You know, in time of crisis, um, if you're going to call yourself a leader, if these businesses that I represent, these part suppliers and all the small towns across, big and small towns across Ontario, if you're going to be the biggest employer in a community and put your name on uh, public buildings and be the sponsors of baseball and soccer teams, um, if you're going to be a leader in good times, uh, the way that you can claim that is a leader when uh, when the trouble hits. So trouble hit last year around this time. Um, probably the week after this last year, I spent uh, the weekend uh, on the phone with people like the Deputy Minister of Economic Development Ontario, the, the former industry minister uh, in Ottawa. And uh, we said, look, uh, there's export controls. If this disease is showing up on our shores, and at the time, you, know, you named a few examples, but like Tom Hanks made everybody wake up. Italy shut shut down, made everybody wake up. I was in New York City on um, probably the 9th and 10th. I got out of New York City, rolling out of there, probably like Indiana Jones, under a closing door, right before um, New York entered into crisis. And so you sit there with the senior government officials and say, look, um, I know nobody makes this stuff here. What's our plan? And not with an accusatory finger and say, maybe I can help you if our whole plan is about import. If you give me the specs uh, and uh, you give me the volumes, maybe I can see whether our our uh, companies can do something about it. I mean, they're all made of the same materials. We remember we needed ventilators at the time and uh, we needed uh, masks, uh, you know, face shields and masks and everything else and swabs and so we put a call out i remember agreeing with the minister of economic development uh giles gerson who who deserves a heck of a lot of uh a heck of a lot of uh, credit here i said to him on that sunday okay i'm going to go out and make a public call i'm going to talk to my board i'm going to talk to our members see see who would volunteer if you go and get the specs and i'll be public about it on monday we'll see what happens and um, 
there's a lot of details I'm going to yada, yada, yada over, but we did it. What we did was 165 companies put their hand up. 70 of the companies I represent, 70, it said, okay, send us the info. 77 said, we did our due diligence. We think we can do it. And ultimately 25 of them got contracted by, by both levels of government to make all kinds of everything. Everything kind of showed up at the right time. And, uh, you know, the auto parts sector may have um, been at the center of it. You know, you know, my team here deserves a heck of a lot of credit. Um, but, you know, we're seeing, I see the Hiram Walker uh, building behind you, you know, that, 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 that business and its peers uh, were very critical in turning around. You remember there was a crisis for hand sanitizer. And there was a whole bunch of business across the country that said, we can do it. So now that we're just about out of it, we hope. Uh, all of those people who stood up uh, when the uh, bullets were flying overhead to say, uh, all right, we'll try to help uh, defend you. Um, in, in my mind, they all deserve uh, 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 as much credit as uh, the frontline workers who have spent an incredibly stressful year uh, on the front lines of that disease. You know, we help to equip them and it's something that uh, I will be proud of, very proud of until uh, the day that uh, I die. Well, I mean, it's just, it's something that is so unimaginable. I keep saying that, but it's, as you said, uh, when we were talking there in the pre-interview, you know, step up the name of the campaign, uh, because oh, yeah. if it wasn't done, then what would have happened? There were no other countries that were looking to, you know, st step up and say, hey, we'll be the one to help Canada. They all had their own things to deal with. And of course, you know, um, there's been uh, generations now of outsourcing that has led to uh, the issue where we didn't have this type of production capacity here. Um, for the companies that did decide to put their hand up, I mean, these were obviously going to be short term contracts. Um, That's right. But what was it like? I mean, dealing with some of these presidents with these CEOs with the unions that were involved in them? what was the mentality like on their side of the table? I mean, it's one thing to ask them to do it and for them to step up and say, yes. I mean, was there concern or was it just, you know, just put on the helmet and do what needs to be done? Really good question. Give me a chance to, to give you a little bit of the lay of the land. We went out there and said, raise your hand, tell me you can do it. Day one, 16 companies said yes, day one. They didn't ask, they just said, you let me know. Companies like uh, down your way, like Windsor Mold Group, and uh, Dave and Keith there, and uh, Pat Plastics, George and Michael there, and a whole bunch of them. I probably won't do them all justice, but, but they said, okay, let's go. And in pursuit of those specs, especially on um, especially on the ventilators, uh, you know, we were working through the night, calling around the world to companies that make them, the OEMs on them, and said, look, I don't, I don't want to we don't need to get in your space. We make car parts and we'll make car parts. We've been making them for hundred years. We've been doing them for the next hundred years, but can we enter into a contract manufacturing relationship with you where you keep hundred percent of the profit, but we need ventilators. If you remember, that was the big crisis at the time. And almost all of them told me to um, politely fly a kite. So I spent the next couple of days talking about all of those conversations publicly and one famous ventilator company, I'll let your listeners and viewers figure out who that is, um, told me it's not going to happen. And um, please stop calling. And um, we've got more than enough. We've got, well, we've got our factory and it'll go up to global demand. And uh, they got interviewed in the next couple of days after I told everybody uh, how they pushed back. And you know, not too long after, maybe within the next couple of weeks, release their specs for, for global uh, use. It's a crazy time. But, you know, clear-eyed uh, the unions, you know, uh, Unifor represents a lot of, uh, let's say 20% of our sector as uh, uh, employees. They were, they were in right from the beginning. There was no questions asked. And um, I was fielding calls. It was a crazy time. Not only were the suppliers in, uh, Ford down in Windsor, I think, at the uh, Essex plant was making uh, face shields. Uh, we worked with Honda to do the same thing. Um, Toyota production, the to Toyota Motor Manufacturing Canada offered from the highest, from CEO up straight to Doug Ford. We put it together where they were going to help roll out testing because, you know, testing was an issue. Right? We were testing like seven, 10,000 people a day. Uh, General Motors started making masks. Uh, people like Chrysler were 
were involved in the ventilators. It was it was an incredible moment. And uh, I have a I have a calendar here that just sits on the wall. And that after a few days in, we just started kind of doing an X, you know, to track this. And we we worked for 49 days straight. And I didn't mind. I mean, we were on adrenaline. There was a whole bunch of stuff happening. But it felt really, really good. I remember watching the, the Premier of Quebec say, we're running out of supplies uh, uh, within days. And Doug Ford uh, came on and he said, it's going to be like a week. And, and we called and said, look, the, the reinforcements are coming. Uh, you know, stay the course. Uh, we're about a week away. And when we first did this, um, I remember a CBC Windsor piece where a couple of esteemed uh, professors from University of Windsor said, uh, can't be done. It's this is not simple stuff. Madness to think that you can turn it around in time and ventilators are very complicated, et cetera. And, uh, you know, they were doing their job and, and doing what uh, doing what academics uh, paid to do, you know, kind of weigh in on what the possibilities are, but it pissed me off. And I said, uh, I tweeted, look, we're in extraordinary times. You either step up or step out of the way. And, uh, you know, with a, this kind of this movement that we were in the middle of became a step up. And I encouraged everybody to, to, to show everybody uh, on Twitter and other social media how they were stepping up. And it was uh, in every facet, lots of, lots of manufacturing companies, lots of service companies. People just said, look, let's see if we can't make it safer for the frontline workers to get to, to keep us safe. And uh, it, um, man, it was a long time ago. My hair is grayer and, and I've got less of it, but it was fulfilling. Well, I, I've captured the hair then that you've lost. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I grow the beard so that what happens is my just my face moved up a bit. So. <laughs> um, really, it's just, it's so great to just speak with you and hear a bit of the behind the scenes because it's something that I think that our community, especially, of course, uh, the communities that are, your members are located in as well, should be incredibly proud of because uh, there were a lot of people who, as you've said, you know, were willing to talk a lot about it, but weren't necessarily willing to uh, do what needed to be done. And even that kind of negative attitude shown by people really hurts with the morale. And I can just say personally, seeing what the work that you were doing, your uh, members were doing at the time, it was a really nice point of, uh, it was inspirational and something to be proud of to see uh, during a pretty dark time. Appreciate that. So wanting to shift topics though, to something, you know, just as exciting, um, you know, I guess, climate change and the existential threat posed by it. Um, as I was saying at the beginning, they're different topics, but they are very similar in that sense that there is this existential threat that needs to be dealt with. And Project Arrow is one of the ways that you're looking to deal with this. Now, this was, you launched it earlier this year in Vegas with the formal RFP process. And I just saw on Twitter yesterday, I believe you said that you blew through the targets. Um, yeah. could, could you talk a little bit about that RFP process? I know that there was an AI component that was um, put together in the, um, the, 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 I guess the, the directing of the flow of the RFP yeah. process. So yeah. if you could talk a little bit about that behind the scenes. Yeah, sure. Listen, this is another history lesson. You know, after uh, after uh, the factories down that way and up this way stopped making uh, planes and tanks and bombs, and guns in uh, World War II, um, the Canadian government said, look, uh, we have the fourth biggest standing army in the world and, and we've got an air force of some uh, repute. Here's some specs of an ultrasonic uh, fighter interceptor that we need to use to defend against uh, the Russians. This is pre-NORAD. So uh, this incredible generation, 60 years ago, not 75 years ago, you know, they got a few more gray hairs, they said, let's give it a shot. And they came up with the Avro Arrow, uh, flew twice as high and twice as fast as anything that the, that the Soviets and the Americans and the British uh, came up with at the time. It's an incredible clean sheet for Canada. And, and then it got canceled. It got canceled for lots of reasons I won't go into, but uh, you know, you had one customer who was gone. But the team that was on that Arrow, uh, 32 of those engineers went on to work for the various industries around NASA. Mercury, Gemini, Apollo program put Americans on the moon. Uh, a lot of them went over to uh, British aerospace and they built the other Delta Wing supersonic uh, uh, plane uh, that a lot of us are fans of uh, the Concorde. And so it was um, 
a real spirit of ingenuity and, 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 and expertise that came out of Canada. Uh, you know, the test pilot for the Arrow was a, was a Polish immigrant to Canada who had, who had flown for the Polish Air Force uh, and then for the RAF uh, during World War II. All of that was a real high watermark for Canadian ingenuity. So we said, why don't we borrow a little bit of that? I went to the throne speech in late 2019 as a as an invite of the prime minister. And I listened to him say, look, uh, um, a net zero carbon economy by uh, by uh, 2050. And then challenged us all. We came back to the office and said, we've been doing demonstration vehicles, putting technology on them for five or six years now. It, vehicles built by Toyota in Ontario. And we said, you know what? We make everything in Canada in automotive from stem to stern. Why don't we make our own car? So we launched at the 2020 uh, CES, before the coronavirus uh, crisis showed up, before all of us learned how to say COVID-19, and we said, we're going to do it. We're going to do a design competition. We ran that design competition uh, during the during the uh, pandemic. It didn't slow us down. Uh, it was chaired by uh, the global head of FCA's uh, design, uh, Ralph Giles, uh, uh, a great, great, uh, inspiring industry uh, leader came up with a design, showed it in October, and we launched the RFP in January. And we said, look, now you want to be on this car? You want to contribute parts and systems and components? Here are the specs. Uh, you know, kind of like the, the uh, PPE step up. Here's the specs. Here's the volume, one. I want one of them. And um, you need to respond by March the 1st. Uh, we, we have this database built for us by uh, YQG Tech down there. Uh, uh, a good uh, Windsor company that said, "Look, we're gonna we're, we're gonna give you a dashboard. It's gonna be AI enabled as the as the bids come in. We're gonna build the different variations of the vehicle so that in real time you can see where the gaps are, and then you can go and micro RFP for those." We had 91 companies interested in January 1st, 2020, when we said, "Let's go out and tell people we're gonna do it." And we had 130 interested uh, when we launched the design, and when we launched the RFP, I said. We need 200 because we need 200. There's 597 major component classes in this car. You know, the, it closed this week and there's 302 companies in there. And we're just blowing through the targets. I think we've tapped into um, uh, a little bit of this Team Canada spirit. A lot of people uh, grew up learning about the Avro Arrow and, um, and they feel it. And, and here what we said is, this car, we're putting this thing together to show off what you can do. As long as it's commercially ready, what you can do based in Canada, let's get it out there. And um, and I swear, if we ran that thing for another month, we'd probably get that four or five hundred. It was, it was we we we've we've got tight timelines because we want to show this thing. Uh, you know, we built the virtual version. The the Windsor Essex uh, Development Commission has got a VR cave, and they built it. And I've I've seen now where it's at. We're, we're ready to unveil it. We, you know, John will invite you when we do it. Yeah, but you can have this immersive VR experience in it as we build out the, the twin, the, the, the physical twin. And um, I'm so excited about it. I can't tell you. Well, that, that really comes across. You, you're getting, you get very excited as you're speaking about it. Yeah. I can tell. Um, so it's a concept vehicle, right? This, right. it's not, it's not going to be production wise. You're doing this to be able to showcase your members and what they're able to do. Now you've described this as an incredibly expensive business card, right? That's right. Yeah. Could you, so I guess to someone who's not really versed, let's say, I guess, outside of the Windsor Essex area, who's not versed in why concept cars are useful and not just a, you know, an experiment in doing things for, for no reason. Um, we obviously know here though, with, uh, with the North American auto show, how important the new release of concept cars are. What's, I guess, what's the elevator pitch for making this incredibly expensive business card? You know, you can turn around, let's say you're in something very simple, like, uh, uh blow molded HVAC parts. You know, you can't see it when you, when you go see a new Mustang, you just see the surfaces. You don't see what's happening underneath, uh, weather telematics, see the result on the screen but i don't see what's in behind it um you know you go out as a part supplier or a system supplier or the tooling company that makes them um and you try to pitch new customers oh god i want to get into the into tesla i want to get into mercedes right now you show up with your component whatever it looks like 
or you show up with a PowerPoint. And what we found on, on the demonstration vehicles that we've done over the years that are already built and we put stuff on it, it's a lot easier to do a sale when, okay, look, here's a rolling vehicle and here's how that system works on it. Um, two things happen on, uh, on uh, doing your own vehicle. On the, on the vehicle that belongs to somebody else, the only technology you can feature is what gets put on a surface. We can't do anything inside the guts. In our own vehicle, we can do the whole thing. And number two, because the vehicle, we said the mandated vehicles is 100% Canadian. We've tapped into this uh, flag waving exercise. You wanna, you wanna show how great you are from a Canadian standpoint, but your Canadian operations, this is the place. When this thing rolls, it's gonna be Team Canada rolling. Don't you wanna be on Team Canada? And Team Canada will get you. I, I, we got those 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 demonstration vehicles into, I think at final count, into see 16 different OEMs. This car, I mean, I've done interviews from uh, Rose City Politics to CNN and everything in between. When I have this car, it's gonna go do uh, the global uh, tour. And that global tour always starts with a couple of industry days. There isn't a better way to showcase your, your your specific company's technology than to be on this on this Team Canada parade. Well, I I'm really excited to see the next iteration when you uh, roll out the full design of it. I guess like the retooling though, what did people say to you when you said like let's do this all Canada, all in our own backyard? Were you laughed out of any rooms at the outset there? Yes, say. You know, listen, you know better than anybody else. A lot of the commoditized goods are moved somewhere else. The electronics uh, come from Asia. Uh, how are you going to compete with Tesla? And I said, well, just because they've moved somewhere else doesn't mean we can't make them here. The question is whether you can make those pieces here profitably. And on the electronics side, look, this isn't about hardware anymore. It's about the brains. Brains are here. The software is here. And uh, I don't need to compete with Tesla. We're inspired by Tesla. We're not building a car company, although I will say somebody else wants to build a car company. We've done all, we're going to do all the homework. We're not taking any shortcuts. And I'm used to uh, John having people say, can't be done. Uh, it fuels me, as you might imagine. Uh, gives us uh, another reason to kind of square up and go through the chains. Uh, but the stuff that people say can't be done isn't, isn't rocket science. You know, in, in, uh, in the 60s, in 1962, uh, JFK said, we're gonna, put, we're gonna put Americans on the moon and not because it's easy, we're gonna do it precisely because it's hard. Well, the Americans with the help of some, some Avro Aero engineers um, put a bunch of people on a rock uh, in outer space with less computing power than a label maker. Why can't I build a concept car? Why can't we make face shields in the middle of a pandemic. Don't think too small. That's what's gotten Canada to a second place in a whole bunch of different categories. Well, it does. It takes the will and it also takes the political will. We're seeing a new presidency across the border. Um, you know, not trying to get too political here on our political talk show, but one that's, you know, arguably more pro progressive than the prior administration. Um, sure. And of course, with our liberal government here under Prime Minister Trudeau, um, it's looking like this is a really good opportunity to have two countries working on the same path. Um, we just saw there's conversation here in Windsor, Essex about a bid for a new battery plant. And we know that prime minister Trudeau has said that he's willing to put money towards it. So I guess, you know, again, getting a little bit more abstract here, um, how would a new electric battery plant in Canada contribute to this all Canadian effort? Um, I know that you've you've been giving quotes about this, but what's the linkage between the two more than, of course, what it just appears on face value? I think it's the reverse. I think what can Project Aero do to help uh, get a battery plant for Canada, which is what we're trying to do here. We're, what we're trying to identify is, so we go through this RFP, we find five companies from across the country, and I'll pull up my notes here, that... Um, are making batteries. There's a there's there's a company called E1 Molly in uh, BC that's making uh, lithium uh, battery cells. But ironically, also kind of like Ballard Systems, but it was the pioneer of it 40 years ago. Do you know, I, I didn't know that. Did you know that? Uh, no, I didn't. Right, exactly. Companies like Summit Nanotech using wastewater from oil and gas to extract lithium to make 
batteries in Alberta. And you know, Electrobaya and Ecamion in Ontario and a whole bunch of solid state and uh, regular lithium batteries uh, companies coming out of Quebec. Companies that we would otherwise not be intimate with if we didn't launch this kind of uh, lighthouse project. Uh, what happened and why you're hearing a lot about a, a, a battery, uh, a potential battery plant in uh, Windsor is because the Development Commission, uh, which has been historically uh, active and creative on very big anchor investments, um, may or may not have a, a nice fish on the line. And it, there's a long shadow between the fish on the line and and on your boat, but it's there. And it's trying to reel it in. And what we're, what's important for those companies, that it's important for uh, battery makers and for the OEMs that have, that have decided that they're, oh, we're gonna make battery electric vehicles in Windsor at the Stellantis uh, FCA plant. Or we're gonna do it at Ford Oakville, or we're gonna do it in General Motors, Ingersoll, or Toyota Cambridge. Where's the supply chain? I'm a battery manufacturer, where's the supply chain? Who's gonna do the, the the, 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 the thermal management uh, stuff, who's cathodes, anodes, we're, we're gonna get graphite. I talked to somebody yesterday on an industrial site and I won't name the place yet, uh, but I will sooner or later. In uh, Southwestern Ontario, it's got 500,000 tons of graphite to be used potentially for cathodes. I mean, how are you going to land those types of investments if you don't know what you have here? And it's not those, those investments and the work that Steve McKenzie and his team are doing at Lutzi isn't uh, to help Project Arrow. And hopefully with Project Arrow, with the notes that we make here, we'll talk to those big companies you're chasing. I'll make the intros for you. We've identified everybody that you need and they're all here. Well, you know, it's just, it, it's amazing the crossover between the two, but I, between the two topics, but I guess it's uh, your skill set, being able to connect people together and see that bigger picture. I, uh, my hair is curly, not straight. And so uh, it's, I hope that's an analogy for people. <laughs> well, Flavio, I really want to thank you for the time that you've taken today to speak with me about uh, these two topics. You know, I find them incredibly, uh, you know, exciting, even though, of course, the retooling one was during such a dark time. Um, just promise me that you're not going to go launching the uh, Project Arrow into one of the Great Lakes when the project is over. We want to make sure that these that it's remembered and not lost to the history books to be revived decades later. When we're done, you will not forget this interview. <laughs> well, looking forward to seeing where it all goes. Flavio Volpe, president of the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association. Thank you for joining me on Rose City Politics. John, it was a pleasure. Thanks.